Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for, for those who have logged in so far. We're going to get started with our presentation in a, a couple of minutes here, allowing for a few more folks to join. So while we're waiting, please feel free to use the chat function and introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and, and throughout the, uh, the webinar today, please please use that to ask us any questions because we will be answering your questions at the uh, towards the end of, of today's session. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thanks, we already have some folks from New Hampshire and a couple folks from Virginia, so East Coast representing. Oh, and Canada, Canada woohoo, and Finland, my goodness, coming from all over. Wow, this is this is wonderful. I'm seeing we have Virginia McKenna, the founder of Born Free, has joined us today. Welcome, Virginia, and thank you so much for uh, for viewing and um, and being a part of this. And we have folks from Wales and Finland, uh, England, a number of places. It's really great to see everyone here. Uh, I think uh, our, if our panelists are all ready, I think let's go ahead and, and jump in. I'm sure folks will keep keep joining us as we as we start along. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for for joining us today. Uh, the global pandemic has certainly brought to light a number of issues with zoos, uh, including animal welfare and and the state of what is the future of zoos. Uh, it's perhaps amplified even that question on how zoos are going to function in terms of their their resilience on visitor ticket fees, which is now of course all upended, putting putting captive animals in peril. Uh, our panel today is going to address a variety of the issues surrounding the keeping of animals on display. And um, I, I just want to give a, a short background on Born Free and, and give you a sense of why zoos are at the very heart of our mission. Uh, our vision is a coexistent future where humans no longer exploit wild animals. And we are working to ensure that all wild animals, whether they're living in captivity or in the wild, are treated with compassion and respect and able to live their lives according to their needs. Born Free is a global organization. We have offices in the United States, the United Kingdom, as well as Kenya, South Africa, and Ethiopia, and collectively throughout the Born Free family, we have programs supporting wildlife communities and habitats on five continents. Uh, we're working to end a number of threats that affect not only species, entire species survival, but also individual lives. And one of those is today's topic, the keeping of animals in zoos. And, and that is really at the heart of Born Free. Uh, we were founded on the belief that wild animals should be kept in the wild, and, and it's no coincidence that we share a name with the iconic film from the 1960s starring our founders Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers. That film told the story of the real life story of Elsa, an orphaned lioness who was rehabilitated and returned to the wild. But it's another of Virginia and Bill's co-stars who, who was the ultimate inspiration for Born Free. Pole Pole was a baby elephant taken from her mother and her family and used in a film called An Elephant Called Slowly, also starring Virginia and Bill. Uh, the Kenyan government had promised her to the London Zoo and Bill and Virginia were successful in convincing the government to allow Pole Pole to remain in Kenya following the filming of An Elephant Called Slowly. But what that would have meant was another elephant family being ripped apart to, to fulfill that, that promise. So poor little Pole Pole was sent to London. And many years later, Bill and Virginia visited her. Pole Pole reached out her trunk remembering them and, and really showing a recognition and a deep connection um, with the couple. So seeing 
seeing her loneliness and, and her suffering, they launched a campaign to have her moved to a more suitable facility. Uh, that campaign was successful, but tragically she died before that, that could happen. And, and Poli Poli lived her nearly her entire life in a zoo, barely having known her native land, barely having known her mother and her family. So today's topic is especially important to us and it's important to the animal wel welfare community. Uh, we're gonna start today's presentations with some, some brief um, comments from our panel and then we're gonna open it up to discussion. And, and again, uh, please use the chat function to comment and to ask questions. And, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panel of speakers. We have Amanda Howell from the Animal Legal Defense Fund and she is the staff attorney there. And in her role, she uses her background in strategic impact litigation to help win legal victories for animals. Prior to joining ALDF, Amanda's career was focused on improving the food system and curbing the harmful practices of multinational corporations. She's dedicated to using her skills to combat, combat inequity and believes that changing how we view and how we treat animals will simultaneously improve life for all sentient beings and positively impact individual health, public health, and our environment. Uh, our, our other panelist, Chris Draper. Dr. Chris Draper is a zoologist and chartered biologist. After exposure to the reality of animals in zoos, circuses, and pseudo-sanctuaries, his career has involved investigation and research into the welfare of wild animals and ex exploited in captivity. His PhD from the University of Bris Bristol examined whether legislation and practice protects animals in zoos, and he is currently one of our colleagues, uh, the head of animal welfare and captivity at the Born Free Foundation in the UK. And finally, our first speaker is Dr. Liz Tyson. Uh, Dr. Tyson is Born Free USA's Programs Director. She's helped animals across the globe. She's helped establish the very first locally run sterilization program for street dogs in the Middle East, worked with indigenous communities in the Colombian Amazon to end the hunting of wild primates, ran a UK charity campaigning to end the exploitation of animals in circuses and zoos, and helped design a new rehabilitation complex for rescued monkeys at Born Free Sanctuary in Ethiopia. And in 2018, she earned her doctorate in animal welfare law. Uh, we really have a, a very impressive panel of experts here to talk to you today. And I'll just say we are all coming to you from our homes, mine in Chicago, Liz down in South Texas, uh, Chris is in West Sussex in England, and Amanda is in Northern California. So you may see some, uh, some appearances from children, dogs, cats, others. So just bear with us as we all navigate this, uh, this webinar from our wonderful homes. And we're so glad to invite you, invite you in with us. So I am going to pass then to Liz to get us started on today's topic. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I'm so delighted to see so many people attending today. We've already had some really interesting discussions actually prior to the event happening. So um, for us, as Angela said, this is at the core of what we do. So to have this discussion about zoos today is really exciting for us. Um, my role here today is really just to set the scene for the upcoming discussion before I hand over to the other expert panelists. Um, and I'd really like to lay down in broad terms Born Free USA's position on zoos and our reasons for it. So as we speak, there are hundreds of thousands of animals held captive in zoos around the world. And their captivity doesn't serve meaningful conservation or educational purposes, but instead serves to entertain zoo visitors and to make profit for the zoos themselves. So animals in zoos are denied the ability to fulfill many, and in some cases, any of their needs. And this invariably leads to suffering. Unlike, for example, domesticated dogs who have been rightly or wrongly selectively bred over millennia to become different animals than their wolf ancestors, an elephant living in a zoo or a monkey living in a zoo or a tiger living in a zoo is the same animal with the same needs as their free living counterparts. And when wild animals are denied their ability to meet their hardwired physical, social and emotional needs, 
their stress, frustration, and trauma manifests in what are known as stereotypical behaviors. And these are baseless, repetitive behaviors which have no apparent benefit for the animals. And importantly, these behaviors are only seen in these animals in captive situations. So these behaviors are caused by the stress of captivity. And they include the head swaying of an elephant, the obsessive pacing of a big cat, the bar biting in their cages of giraffes, rocking backwards and forwards of bears, self-inflicted harm of monkeys chewing fingers and tails, and the overplucking of chest feathers of captive birds. And they're telling us with this that they don't want to be there. Um, but so often we either don't see this for what it is or we simply don't listen. Zoos fail to effectively educate. A child visiting a zoo will learn the size and shape of an elephant or a tiger, but they will learn nothing from looking at that animal, how, that, how the elephant or the tiger should live in their natural habitat. Research has shown that children visiting one of the world's leading zoos came away having learned nothing, or even worse, as the research calls it, having a negative learning experience. So they learned either false information or they came away literally knowing less than they did when they went in. And importantly, this is something that's often overlooked, but zoos perpetuate colonialist viewpoints, which further false narratives of local and indigenous people as ignorant of or uncaring towards environmental conservation. And instead, the zoos position themselves as the saviors in conservation narratives. And this means it not only does a disservice to local and indigenous conservationists, but it means people go away from the zoo not really understanding the causes and impacts of conservation issues, nor how they might be tackled effectively on the ground where change is really possible. Really importantly, and perhaps obviously, zoos present human dominion over animals as the norm. They tell us it's our right to hold these animals captive, and moreover, it is our right to go and see them, regardless of the impact that that, in, that has on the animals themselves. And for this and many other reasons, we believe that zoos are harmful to educational efforts for people, the environment, and animals. In conservation terms, despite their insistence to the contrary, zoos don't serve meaningful conservation goals. The animals bred in zoos will live in zoos and they will die in zoos. They will not be released. The zoos don't even pretend they will be because they argue that the wild is too dangerous a place to release animals into with the diminishing habitat and the various threats. But this begs the question then, why are these animals being bred in perpetuity to spend a life in captivity? And the question is particularly important when we consider that the majority of species and the vast, vast majority of individual animals in zoos are not threatened in the wild at all. And zoos would have us believe that they're quote unquote saving species from extinction. But those of us who've worked in conservation for years know that species are saved when work is carried out in the animal's natural habitat. Real conservation work is incredibly complex. It involves local people, a profound understanding of the geopolitical, economic, social, and environmental factors influencing that specific location. And this work is not, and indeed cannot, be achieved by holding animals captive thousands of miles away in city center zoos in the US and Europe. And to counter this criticism, zoos further argue that they fund important in situ conservation work and that they need to hold animals captive because people don't give of their own accord to conservation efforts. But that isn't true either. The fact is that individual NGOs consistently over many, many years provide more funding for conservation independently of one another than the entire zoo community of World Association of Zoo and Aquarium members put together. And this has been acknowledged in research actively promoted by the zoo industry itself. That was a whirlwind tour of the kind of real core areas that we're concerned about are born for USA regarding zoos. We're concerned about animal welfare and we're concerned about distracting and false claims surrounding education and conservation. Having summarized those, we're going to return back to those in the roundtable section of this webinar. But for now, I'm really delighted to be able to hand over to Amanda Howell, um, who Angela says is staff attorney at ALDF, and they do fabulous work um, really holding failing zoos to account. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Liz. I appreciate it. And thank you all for having me here. Um, Again, I'm, I work at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, um, and the mission of that organization is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. Um, and one main area of focus of ALDF is captive wildlife in all of its forms, and that includes whether it's a tiger at a cage in a truck stop, which is actually something that we've seen, um, roadside zoos, which tend to be operated by private individuals with very few resources, 
and often no formal wildlife, animal husbandry, or veterinary training, or even municipal zoos or zoos that people look to as you know, the, the gold standard that often do fail to meet the unique and demanding psychological and social needs of animals. Um, the LDF and attorneys there try to address the harms to these animals by bringing lawsuits against zoos that abuse or, or neglect the animals there. Um, and Liz touched on this, and it's something that I think bears repeating that even in the best possible case scenario with zoos, uh, we have animals that are incapable of exhibiting their natural behaviors, animals that would otherwise be roaming for hundreds of miles confined to, you know, tiny enclosures. Um, it's an unnatural environment, oftentimes unnatural so socialization, and again, they're forever captive. Um, what unfortunately is the more likely scenario with zoos, especially roadside zoos, is animals are provided inadequate food, water, or shelter, um, inadequate veterinary care, sometimes a complete lack of veterinary care. Um, they experience the frustration of their instincts and experience immense psychological su suffering, which as um, Liz mentioned, we see in stereotypic behaviors, the pacing, the head banging. Um, all this translates to basically animals are being neglected and abused and even tortured um, by remaining captive. Um, as we see here, there are very few laws that actually cover animals in zoos. Um, I'm going to try and focus on the Animal Welfare Act. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the Animal Welfare Act does cover zoos. It provides minimum requirements for handling, housing, feeding, watering, sanitation uh, for animals. Um, people tend to think that because an, a zoo is licensed by the USDA, that means that it's meeting very high uh, standards of care and in terms of um, the psychological needs, the enclosures, things like that. But unfortunately, uh, the Animal Wel Welfare Act provides very, very few and very meager um, bare minimum standards. In fact, uh, enclosures are considered sufficient if an animal can kind of sit, stand up, turn around, uh, stretch its arms or wings, uh, and lay down. Um, and obviously that is nothing like what the animal would be experiencing in the wild. Um, also, the USDA Animal Welfare Act provides that uh, there are USDA inspections uh, for zoos, which sounds like a good thing, but um, up until very recently and after a result of a, a lawsuit that brought by ALDF, um, those inspection reports, which used to be public available, uh, were blacked out. So members of the public couldn't even see which zoos were um, getting really bad citations and were violating the Animal Welfare Act. Um, thankfully, that, that's back public, publicly available. But again, zoos continue to operate even despite um, being chronic violators of the Animal Welfare Act. They maintain their exhibitor licenses. Um, uh, the next slide, please. So just kind of a list of the limitations and obstacles in addition, um, the Animal Welfare Act, even for zoos, only covers warm-blooded animals. So that leaves out, you know, your lizards, your amphibians. Um, it also leaves out birds and rats and mice, any farmed animals that um, are not being exhibited. Um, so it's, it's really kind of, uh, it seems like it's all-encompassing, but it's, it's very much not that. Um, and then we pair that with the fact that the USDA has limited resources and especially currently uh, very little inclination to hold zoos accountable to the AWA and very little inclination to not just rubber stamp license renewals, which is deeply unfortunate. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, the other law that animal uh, lawyers have at their disposal is the Endangered Species Act. Um, thankfully, thanks to a lawsuit brought by ALDF, um, we've established that the ESA actually does apply to captive wildlife, um, and that prevents zoos from harming or taking animals, um, which, as you see here, it's uh, defined and harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, which um, would also cover animal neglect that animals experience in zoos. The next slide, please. Um, okay, thank you. Um, but again, some serious drawbacks of the ESA include that you know, we're only able to go after um, animals that are abused or neglected that are covered by the ESA and as in listed as endangered species. So that's, um, you know, and it, it's, a, it's a serious limitation. It's one that we've um, deeply felt when we try and rescue all the animals at zoos, um, which kind of brings me to my uh, case study, if you will. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, okay, uh, we'll skip to the next one, sorry, thank you. Um, Cricket Hollow Zoo. Um, Cricket Hollow Zoo has been um, in existence since 
the early 90s and it's been exhibiting uh, animals uh, in a permanent basin since I think um, early 20, 2014, I believe. Um, the animals there were uh, in, in awful conditions. Um, there were over 200 animals there, um, according to the Animal Welfare Act uh, animal inventories, but we found much more animals um, when we were able to shut down the zoo um, this past winter. Um, we have had so many lawsuits against Cricket Hollow Zoo because of their chronic uh, neglect and um, abuse of animals. Um, the first set of lawsuits were under the ESA and we were able to rescue um, some lions and tigers and lemurs, um, but unfortunately that left you know, hundreds of animals there that were not covered by the ESA. Um, and I think I have some uh, pictures of Cricket Hollow Zoo that we can kind of just click through. Um, and so we were forced to bring um, a, a little bit more creative litigation um, recently under uh, Iowa's public nuisance laws, um, basically for their chronic violations of the state's animal cruelty laws. Um, so as you can see here, there were bears kept in corn cribs. Um, the next slide, please. Um, these were uh, three baboons that were kept, as, and you can see this, this enclosure, that was their enclosure, um, the entirety of it, other than a tiny back building for the winter. Um, and again, baboons are incredibly social animals. And uh, the good news here, and I think we'll get into this a bit later, hopefully, um, these baboons are actually now located at Born Free. Um, so uh, it took, you know, the better part of a decade to shut down Cricket Hollow Zoo uh, in its entirety. And took a lot of creative litigation um, and the existence of the Animal Welfare Act and the existence of the ESA um, were helpful but it uh, was very it, it took a lot of resources and it took a lot of time um, and you know and many unfortunately animals died um, in the interim before we were able to actually finally shut down the zoo um, and I think that I'm a little bit over my time so I think I'm going to uh, pass it over to Chris but I uh, would love to return to the specifics of Cricket Hollow um, and you know roadside zoos in general uh, after afterwards thank you thank you Amanda and thank you Angela um, I'm just going to offer a few additional thoughts on top of what Amanda and Liz have already outlined um, from a European perspective, really. Um, so something we haven't really touched on yet is, is what are zoos? Um, and within Europe, it's quite easy to define them because there's a, a definition in law, which is that any facility that is open to the public for seven or more days in a year, keeping non-domesticated species of vertebrates or invertebrates for exhibition to the public. So anything that meets that definition is considered a zoo and as such in the UK and across the EU requires a license to operate as a zoo. Um, what that means is it includes um, large metropolitan establishments that we're familiar with, you know, the classic city zoos, um, safari parks, but also many smaller and less ob obvious establishments like children's farm parks with exotic animals, public aviaries, falconry centres, some animal sanctuaries even, um, and theme parks, even pubs with animal enclosures in their gardens. So taking that definition of a zoo, in the UK there are upwards of 350 licensed zoos and similar or slightly greater numbers in uh, European countries like France and Germany. Um, overall, there's probably two and a half to 3,000 zoos um, across the EU. And I would say internationally, globally, there's that 10,000 zoos would be a conservative estimate for the number of, of zoos. And of course, with, with that comes the, you know, the, the need to acknowledge that each zoo will be keeping tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of individual lives uh, within their, their facility. And then you scale it up across 10,000 zoos and you realize it's an enormous uh, responsibility that uh, zoos have in their hands. Um, within the, U the UK and the EU, um, it's not, Running, you know, operating a zoo is not just about uh, maintaining some basic standards of animal welfare. Um, zoos are required by law to promote public education and awareness in relation to the conservation of biodiversity, in particular by providing information about the species of wild animals they keep. Um, and they also have to participate in at least one of five so-called conservation activities. Um, and also they're supposed to prevent their animals escaping, they're supposed to prevent so-called pests and vermin from coming into the zoo, and they're supposed to keep 
up-to-date records of, of their animal collection. Um, obviously, we, we have an increasing catalogue of evidence that shows that many, many zoos fail on one or all of those, those points. Um, but because there is this legal requirement to demonstrate at least some involvement in what might be considered conservation, um, this has the ca unfortunate counter effect where it's taken, often taken to mean that licensed zoos are active in conservation when in, re in reality their participation is minimal or even non-existent. And I think we're going to touch on that point later. Um, again, something else I'm sure we're going to talk about and we've heard already, you know, animal welfare in zoos. I think it's an understatement to say that there's an emerging catalogue of evidence of the negative effects of captivity on the welfare of animals. However, in comparison to other animal keeping systems, such as farms and laboratories and many other ways that we exploit animals, um, the welfare of animals in zoos has actually been much less researched uh, and consequently how to meet the needs or at least come close to meeting the needs of animals in zoos, far less understood and therefore I would argue protected much less rigorously than other animal keeping systems. Um, couple that with the range of species that zoos keep uh, and the variation in the makeup of, of species within zoos, it, you, you get to realize that the that zoos are unlike any other animal keeping system and it, this means that generalizations and implementation of standards are impossible to you know to to ensure um, unfortunately people are being led to believe that zoos have the de detailed information on the biology of the animals they keep uh, and also that they've developed species specific husbandry guidelines for for many of the species that they commonly keep However, that frankly is not the case. Um, there is a lack of basic biological information and field data for many of the species that are currently kept in zoos. And this in all likelihood leads to a corresponding lack of knowledge of the normal behavior and requirements of these animals. And as a consequence, the, it, it has a knock on effect of I, I'm being unable to ensure basic animal welfare standards. Um, it's clear that only a minority, a very small minority of commonly kept species have some guidelines within the zoo industry. Uh, and there are variations even amongst those. And it's, it seems quite clear that housing and husbandry guidelines for zoos appear to be based very much on tradition or current practice rather than on any scientific basis. And that gives some significant concerns to me and others about the current state of animal welfare in zoos. And um, of course, you know, the issues, the ethical issues around um, animals in zoos, it don't, doesn't just stop at the welfare and the suffering of animals. There are also other practices such as the culling of healthy animals. Uh, many of you may recall the case of Marius the giraffe, who was a young and healthy giraffe who was deemed to be surplus to requirements in the breeding program uh, being kept at Copenhagen Zoo. It was announced that the zoo intended to kill Marius and despite offers to rehome him, the zoo proceeded to shoot him, pub publicly dissect his body and uh, feed it to the zoo's carnivores in what they termed an educational uh, activity. In the international outrage that followed, it, it was, became very clear that there's very few accurate figures of how many healthy animals are killed in zoos across the world. I would say that it is in the thousands to tens of thousands in each region, global region, but validating accurate data is very challenging. So for this reason and for the other reasons I've, I've outlined just above that, that in the UK, Born Free is calling for greatly incre increased transparency regarding issues such as the welfare of animals in zoos, the killing of healthy animals by zoos and the real level of conservation participation by zoos. Um, I just wanted to end very quickly on an issue um, that Angela flagged at the start, which is the impact of the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, and if to do so, I might just open up some slides very quickly. Um, uh, sorry. Um, It's not, <laughs> not as uh, 
that that seems to be working. I hope, tell me if it's not. Um, Obviously, coronavirus, it poses some threats to animals. You know, there, there have been examples of great apes and other um, old world primates uh, that, that are certainly at, at the cusp of being infected with coronavirus. So I think that's a consideration in, in zoological facilities. Um, there has been a, a small isolated outbreak of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the, the official name of the virus, in big cats at the Bronx Zoo uh, in the US. And uh, there have been various small isolated cases where on a mink farm, unfortunately, uh, it was shown that uh, the animals contract coronavirus and domestic, domestic cats, um, both in a domestic environment and also in a laboratory environment, have been shown to pick, to pick up the, the disease. Um, but this leaves us with a load of questions about animals and COVID. Um, how is, is he, easy is it for these animals to become infected? How serious are the effects on, on animals? But most importantly, can animals that, that we're talking about in, in, as, as companion animals and as uh, animals in zoos, can they infect humans? Um, regardless of the answers to those questions, coronavirus has had an impact on zoos and approximately 90% of global zoos um, closed to visitors at some point. Uh, in the US, 60% of AZA zoos took loans to, uh, to cover themselves during closure. Um, all UK zoos were closed for a period of months. And if you think about zoos in the UK, they can have monthly operating costs of 4,000 to upwards of 2.3 million pounds per month. Um, and finding the, the money to fill that gap in order to prevent starvation and other significant welfare problems um, is, is a great concern. And also um, to prevent unnecessary culling and subsequent replacement perhaps of animals when, they, when the zoos reopen becomes a real issue. So just as a final um, concern, what we really need to see is, is that animals are protected throughout the pandemic, but to avoid shoring up those zoos that are already uh, failing in terms of their business model and that are already causing animals to suffer just in, under normal circumstances. Um, as a, an, a consequence of that in the UK, uh, zoos were allocated 140 million pounds uh, as a, su a support fund um, and of course they've reached out through crowdfunding appeals and just some examples here of some two smaller zoos easy, a, a, easily able to raise a couple of months operating costs and Chester Zoo which put out a large appeal to save our zoo and within the space of a few days brought in 2.75 million. Um, so where does this, what does this mean for zoos in the future? I think there are going to be inevitably changes to practices in zoos where things like walkthrough exhibits with certain animals are going to not be allowed. Um, obviously distancing between people is gonna impact on the number of visitors in zoos. But it's inevitable, I believe, that a proportion of zoos, and again, I'm not just talking within the European context, I suspect globally, a proportion of zoos will close. How big that proportion is, we don't yet know. I think there'll be an enormous impact of uh, the winter season um, because in many climates, uh, zoos make their money in the summer and they spend their money in the winter. If they haven't had an opportunity to make money in the summer, winter will be uh, the thing that causes them to close. Um, it'll affect zoos differently depending on the resources and size and scale. But of course, it will need it will lead to a need for rehoming of some animals, and we can only sit and wait to see just how bad things get in that re in that regard. But in the UK, at least 17 zoos have made inquiries about closing. Um, but as just a final point on this, closing zoos is not easy under normal circumstances, and it's not cheap. Um, a medium-sized zoo that was uh, earmarked for closure, the cost of, of uh, divvying up the animals to other zoos were, came in at uh, over a quarter of a million pounds. And that was when other zoos were operating freely and able to take in others, other um, so I suspect under the current situation, we're facing a bit of a, um, uh, an un well, an uncertain future for zoos, but mo more importantly, a real concern of how we uh, ensure the welfare of animals in zoos across the, wo the world. So at that point, I will hand back to Angela. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Chris, Amanda and Liz for, for getting us uh, 
kind of up to speed in introducing this topic. And, and I want to start jumping in with some of the questions that we have. Uh, Chris, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct this, this first one back to you because, you know, you just stopped talking. Um, and just so you know, your sound was cutting in and out just a little oh, bit. So I don't oh, know sorry. if that's, that's okay. Um, might be just technology or, you know, maybe stay, stay closer to your mic if you can. Um, but we had some questions about the, the differences between good and bad zoos. And, you know, in some of the, the zoos with larger enclosures, animals who may not be displaying the, the stereotypic behaviors, like really, I guess, can you address, are there good zoos, are there bad zoos? It's an incredibly important question and something that can confront me on an almost daily basis and something that people very often want to know the answer to. Um, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, which is that um, thinking of things as good or bad zoos is not actually a very helpful way of dividing up the situation. I'll tell you why I say that is that, you know, you hear, you hear good or bad, you hear things like accredited or roadside zoos. As, as another um, distinction to be made within the spectrum of zoos. Quite often what we're talking about is, is more like conformist or non-conformist management by these zoos or traditional versus maverick zoos or wealthy versus poor zoos. Those are the more, um, well, they, those are more likely to be the rationales for why there are variations in, in zoos. But we need to move away from thinking of how zoos affect animals at the level of the zoo. We need to think of it at the level of the animal. And what the major impact on animals' welfare is, is their single enclosure in which they spend their lives. What happens in the rest of the zoo is of almost negligible impact on an animal in the zoo. So what I'm getting at is that I can go to a zoo where that somebody has told me is better than others. Um, and I will see enclosures that, yes, okay, I can see money has been spent, that they're perhaps a little larger. Are they good enough for the animals they keep? No, absolutely not. But more than that, I can walk away from that enclosure and go to another enclosure around the corner in the same so-called better zoo and see something that is totally outdated and totally not fit for purpose for the animals that it keeps. So I struggle with these with these artificial distinctions of good versus bad zoos and i think um, amanda made uh, a point that you know accredited zoos versus roadside zoos you still see problems in accredited zoos um significant problems in accredited zoos just as you do in roadside zoos so to me it becomes a bit of a, a an artificial dichotomy and if I may, actually, uh, just as to the point of accreditation, you know, I think a lot of people look to third party accreditation like AZA and ALAC and think, oh, that's better. They're objective somehow. I, I do not think they're objective. They make their money from uh, basically these licenses, their accreditation. Um, and, you know, they have very infrequent site visits. They announce their site visits ahead of time. Um, so you're not actually, they're not, the inspectors are not actually seeing what the circumstances are on a daily basis. And they really work with the zoos um, to make sure they can keep their accreditation even when, you know, sometimes they shouldn't. Um, and they don't enforce the Animal Welfare Act standards. They have their own separate standards, which, um, you know, might be different or worse, depending on, on which body we're talking about. Sorry, thanks. Absolutely, and that also applies in the UK and Europe. We've got BRs, which is um, of zoo members, and um, managed by four zoo members, and ERs is a larger version of the same. So um, there's been plenty of cases where complaints have been brought to them. I worked on a campaign where um, one of the largest zoos in the UK sold tiger cubs to a circus trainer, um, and Biaza, which is the equivalent of AZA, said that they would investigate, but the guy who ran the zoo was the head of the committee who was in charge of that area, and of course it got pushed under the carpet. So um, often the accreditation bodies are effectively kind of trade representatives of the same industry. Thank you everyone for addressing that. There's another question that has come in on in various different forms from our attendees and and that is the the, the claim or the importance or how zoos are a part of conservation. 
and saving species from extinction by breeding animals. Uh, Liz, I think I'll, I'll throw that to you and then anyone else uh, jump in after. Absolutely. I think uh, the, the issue of breeding in zoos is, is a really interesting one. It's the one that's thrown out by the zoo industry as saving species, keeping animals safe from the dangerous wild. Um, and it's just such a distraction from real conservation issues. I think the first point to make is that, as I said earlier, the vast majority of species held in zoos are not threatened in the wild. And the vast majority of individual animals, then you're looking at the tiniest percentage of, for example, critically endangered animals even held in zoos in the first place. So breeding those non-threatened animals, there's, there is no argument that that serves conservation. Looking at actually breeding the critically endangered animals, the few that are there, the argument is just kind of illogical. It's this idea that you're keeping a species safe or you're saving a species, but the elephant whose life in, is in danger in Zimbabwe from poachers is not saved by a baby elephant being bred in the Bronx Zoo or Chester Zoo in the UK. They're two completely independent entities, but you know, one isn't a facsimile of the other which cancels the other one out. And I think this is part of a fundamental disconnect in the way that we consider species in the way, for example, we as, as advocates consider animals and the way the zoo industry does. So if we're considering saving species, it only really works if your consideration of, of an animal is that all they exist to be is a genetic vehicle for their DNA. So an elephant in effectively carries on the genetic material it doesn't matter, they as an individual with a life that is worth something or any kind of value is irrelevant. And then that works because then the elephant in the wild, if that elephant is killed and there's no more elephants in, in the wild anymore, we can pat ourselves on the back and say, but we have these examples of elephants in zoos. But to what end? If we honestly think that saving species is literally just having these genetic examples existing in captivity for their entire lifetimes where their ability to live free has gone, then I think we really need to reconsider what we, how we believe we're saving them. Um, you know, so I think it's, a, it's perception and zoos do not consider animals as individuals in the same way that I would hope our audience here today would. I, I obviously concur with everything Liz has said. I mean, in terms of, um, if, if I can just show, if, <laughs> flag another few slides, there's uh, a, some, uh, one or two facts and figures that might put some of this into perspective. Um, so, it, the WAZA, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, has a, has a, a World Zoo and Aquarium strategy that, that it encourages other zoos to, to follow. And this recommends that um, to achieve meaningful conservation outcomes, zoos and aquariums should focus their attention on threatened species for which they can make a difference. Um, so going to the point that Liz said is like, well, okay, in which case, what proportion of animals in zoos are threatened? And I've got some, some data here from a reasonably large sample of British zoos, including a large number of BRZA members, which is like our AZA, um, looking at mammal species. And that's the proportion, the red, of the species that they keep that are threatened with extinction. And if you looked at birds, that proportion would be even smaller. And if you looked at reptiles and amphibians, it would be smaller still. So by far, the largest number of species that are kept in British zoos, and I suspect that's the same the world over, they are not threatened with extinction in the wild. Um, and also you're dealing with tiny little pockets of, of populations, as I know Liz uh, just mentioned, where most species are actually only kept by one or a few zoos. Um, less than 8% of species were kept by uh, 20 or more zoos. And uh, more than a quarter of mammal species in British zoos were kept by just one zoo. Um, and if you're talking about those with large populations of seven species that had more than 500 individuals in, in British zoos, uh, a population of more than 500, only one of seven were, was a threatened species. The remaining were considered to be least concerned. So I think just whizzing through some, just one other point I wanted to make, which is that zoos, okay, if they're not keeping significant numbers of threatened species within their walls, it must be that they're making um, that you know they're making money to send to conservation projects in the field and if you ask the general public um, in, in Britain what they consider zoos are spending on conservation in the, in, in the wild 
you get a majority answer around 40 to 50 percent of zoos income is being spent on conservation in the wild when actually in, in reality even within the best zoos uh, and again, I've said that word best. I mean, um, you know, the accredited type zoos. The figure is somewhere around three to seven percent uh, at best uh, of their income is going on conservation in the world. So they're not keeping threatened species. And frankly, they're not giving a lot of their money to conservation in the wild. Just two final examples I plucked up the other day. Eight zoos, just eight zoos in the US spent or announced plans to spend 640.7 million bucks on developments at their zoo. So new enclosures, a new gate, whatever it is. Um, that is about 60% of what it would cost to preserve all of Africa's protected areas containing lions, the remaining population of lions in Africa, just across eight zoos. AZA zoos in total, in 2018 spent on operations and construction at their zoos 4.9 billion dollars and that is more than the cost that has been estimated to protect all threatened species across the world for a year so there is something desperately desperately wrong with the system where we are allowing zoos to spend such ridiculously large sums on what they would term conservation when the problem facing conservation in the wild still continues. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to get get on to uh, some of the, the questions on on the laws and 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 regulations and, and how we address these issues. But but first I'd I'd like to uh, someone to uh to address the the education value and and we're talking about conservation we're talking about the animals and the behavior and the conditions but what about uh, a common perception is that zoos educate children um i who would like to take that question i'll throw that open to the panel liz <laughs> finger up I've got a whole thing about this. Um, I could talk about this all day, but I won't. Um, so research has shown that, that it is, it's a really popular narrative with zoos that they educate. Um, and research has shown, the little research that's been done has shown that yeah, zoos do have educational programs, they have educational staff, but there was very little research done on the actual impact of that education. So whether it was working or not was just, it was the, they exist, we don't really know what they do. And um, that was actually criticized in the UK back in 2010, 2011 by an independent survey. And then there's been very few research studies since then, but one that was carried out, which was somewhat comical because it was carried out in order to prove the impact that zoos had on education and the data actually showed the exact opposite. Um, so the research I mentioned that showed that the majority of people going, majority of children going to one of the world's leading zoos came out having learned pretty much nothing and some of them had negative learning. So they came away with false information. But I think kind of aside from that, then while zoos go to great lengths to promote their educational value, let's be honest, people don't go to the zoo on a Saturday afternoon because they want to be educated. They go to look at the animals, they go to be entertained. And to be honest, as someone, and I'm sure Chris and Amanda have had similar things, Angela, as people who've worked on this issue for, you know, decades, some of us, what we get asked more regularly is this kind of angry demand, well, how do you expect my child to see an animal if we don't see them in zoos? We can't all afford to go on safari to Africa. You and me both kid, I can't either. Um, the concern isn't about education. The concern is about the perceived right to see these animals, regardless of the fact that the animals suffer as a result of us as kind of exercising that right. Um, but I think for those who, who do argue that their concern is education, this demand that how will our children learn about animals, it just seems really disingenuous because we have an entire global schooling system which involves children going to these things called schools that have been established for some time as you know an acceptable way of teaching. Um, and you know we have educators who particularly at this time you know during COVID we've had these amazing educators who kept the education system going and teaching kids in their own homes from their own homes they don't have to leave to learn things good educators inspire children um, you know children learn through art and literature and books and documentaries 
and you know the way that we learn every other subject and I think the argument it's just this again it's a distraction it's this argument if children can't learn about animals without sitting in front of a living breathing animal then how do we all know a kid who's absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs or out of space or you know it would be literally impossible to learn history it just doesn't make sense. We don't educate in that way. We don't need to educate in that way. And when it means holding hundreds of thousands of animals captive, we just need to find a better way to do it, you know? And this is something that Liz, I think you touched on and Chris touched on as well. I, I again, want to kind of emphasize the what, what are they actually learning? And I, I have to say like that philosophically, they're learning that humans are you know, other than animals and animals are not individuals and they don't experience life the same way. They don't have as much of an inner life if we look at them as, you know, entertainment, if we look at them in cages. Um, so I'd say that that is, you know, not only are they not learning what, you know, about the animals from zoos, they're learning something really kind of awful, um, the, the way that our society views animals when they see animals in zoos and in, in captivity. Thank you, Amanda. I'm glad you're on because I want to throw the next couple of questions to you. And this is particularly concerning the laws that are in place to protect animals who are held in zoos. Um, how does the licensing work? Is it sufficient? Where's the authority in, in reporting and, and shutting down zoos if that's where we're going? And that's a big question, I realize. It is, and it's kind of a can of worms, and there are a lot of things going. I mean, we touched on the fact that the Animal Welfare Act is, you know, fundamentally insufficient, has very minimal standards, and then we talk about the enforcement and the lack of resources and the people enforcing it, and, you know, the fact that, um, you know, places like Cricket Hollow Zoo have been on USDA's radar for, you know, well over a decade with over 100 a AWA uh, violations and citations, and they maintained their exhibitor list, or uh, their exhibition um, license. And you know, that took how much parting from how many lawsuits, how, how much resources and man hours to shut down one roadside zoo. And I don't even know how many roadside zoos are scattered across the country. Um, and that's not to even get into how many lawsuits we've had against places that people think of as kind of more um, valid or, or, or better than, you know, this whole better zoo. Um, you know, we've had ESA lawsuits for animals being kept in completely social isolation, um, an orca kept in basically a, a glorified pool by herself um, for the entirety of her life, and she'd been a wild animal before that. And so I can't imagine like the psychological torture. Um, and the AWA doesn't even touch on that. Um, so basically, again, uh, we have these inspections. They are do not go far enough. I will say that it is useful for lawsuits like the ones that ALDF brings to have those um, USDA APHIS inspection reports because then we can use those reports to basically bring lawsuits under different laws that are also applicable, um, like state animal cruelty laws and uh, public nuisance laws for violations of those state animal cruelty laws. I will say again, the existence of the AWA is kind of problematic because again, people, including uh, government officials, state level officials think that, oh, the USDA has this. So you'll see a lot of punting um, on the part of uh, state and local gov government officials, even when they see what can only be you know, deemed as, as absolute neglect and torture of animals, they say, well, they have a USDA inspect uh, uh, report and sorry, <laughs> they have a USDA uh, license, so everything must be fine on the up and up. Um, and obviously we see that that is not the case. Um, and only after being sued by ALDF did USDA actually take steps to revoke U uh, Cricket Hollow's license, um, which they did in 2017. And then the owners of that zoo simply appealed. Um, and then that took another four years, I think, before the license certification was actually final. And I don't know how many animals died in the interim. Um, so it takes, <laughs> I guess that was a long and meandering way of saying that uh, the problem is not just in the, uh, the letter of the law, it's definitely in the enforcement. Um, it's in the, uh, the lack of appetite at the state and, and local levels as well. Um, and, you know, the USDA, even when it has the authority that it does to shut places down, they, they tend to not. And with Cricket Hollow, another reason we brought a, a separate lawsuit under um, the state laws is because we were not convinced that USDA would actually use its authority 
to rescue the animals and put them into sanctuaries uh, once the uh, license, the Cricket Hollow's license was revoked. Once, you know, USD might just say, well, license revoked, you can't have these animals, and has no um, care given or, you know, attention given to where those animals go. And I, I would have bet that they would have just ended up at other roadside zoos um, and sold to other roadside zoos, which would have, you know, financially helped these people who had been abusing animals for over a decade. Thank you. There's uh, no easy solution, is there? <laughs> so uh, I want to try to combine kind of the last two questions. Um, we we've had a few coming in on this, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask maybe Chris or Liz to kind of address because I think these are interrelated. What is the difference? between a zoo and a sanctuary, um, sanctuary, say, licensing, accreditation. And I think this also relates to kind of the bigger question of the day maybe is, what happens to all the animals if the zoos were to close? So if you can take that very heady question, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll turn it over to either Liz or, or Chris. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and Liz can, can pick up the mess that I make. Um, so, well, look, what's the difference between a zoo and a sanctuary? L let's be clear, sanctuary doesn't have a legal definition. And in my experience, it's one of the most misused terms. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But taking a sort of common understanding of what we mean by an animal sanctuary, a rescue center, a, a place where rescued animals can go to, um, Let's be clear, zoos are not sanctuaries. Um, that doesn't mean that some zoos don't rescue a few animals, because they do. Um, and I, I think that's increasing in modern times, um, because the industry is creating so many animals and, and zoos are able to, on occasion, help out other zoos. But it's not their, it's not zoos legacy or zoos mandate or their raison d'etre to be a rescue center for uh, animals. Zoos exhibit animals to the public. Uh, that's the, their unifying feature. Um, genuine sanctuaries are not zoos because genuine sanctuaries don't breed. Um, they replace their animals only through rescue, not through purchase or, or other things like that, if we're talking about wild animals. Um, they don't exploit animal, the animals they keep for um, commercial gain. They don't have unescorted visitation, I would say. I think that's an important thing, where, whereas a zoo flings open its gates at the beginning of the day and then shuts them at the end. Sanctuaries, if they allow visitation at all, it should be under a controlled and guided uh, system whereby animals are not impacted. There's quite clear characteristics of what makes a genuine sanctuary and what that isn't uh, is a zoo. Where we get into difficulties, of course, is that there are some, and a great many, unfortunately, very poor facilities, very poor standard facilities that are labeling themselves as sanctuaries. And it creates a lot of confusion in people's minds and allows people to think that they're doing good work when they're not. Liz. That's great. Thank you. Liz, do you want to maybe try to address in, in our last couple of minutes, because I am mindful of time, the question of what, what would happen if, if all the zoos suddenly closed? Absolutely. Um, I think we're realistic. And often that's how, obviously, we, we don't want animals to be in zoos, but we're also realistic about the trajectory that we would need to follow if we were to see um, a move towards zoo closures. And it would obviously be a very phased um, process because there are hundreds of thousands of animals there is simply not the sanctuary structure capacity resources to rehome and rescue all of those animals we are not advocating for opening the gates and letting everybody do their own thing nor are we advocating rescuing every animal from zoos right now we wish they weren't there in the first place but we understand we need to work with the system so really what we're looking at is a phase-out approach where we would see things like zoo breeding programs stopping because as we've talked about in detail, they're not serving conservation. They're certainly not serving the animals. 
So we see an end to killing animals like Marius the giraffe and the thousands of others who are, who are killed because they're deemed surplus to requirements. We see zoos adopt protocols which are more in line with sanctuary processes such as a home for life. We wouldn't see animals carted around the world arbitrarily to join different breeding programs. You know, the only reason that you would move an animal was if it was in their welfare interest. So we are looking at a process that if we started right now, you know, some animals, elephants can live, you know, 60, 70 years, um, some of the great apes the same, um, you know, lots of animals with very long lives. We don't think this is going to happen within the next five years, 10 years, even 20 years. What we're saying is we need to start that process now. COVID has made it clear that zoos don't have a contingency plan. You know, everything hit the fan after a couple of weeks and we had news articles out there with zoos saying we're going to have to feed the animals to the other animals. You know, so zoos also need to take financial responsibility and start building those plans, whether that is partnership with other zoos, the smaller zoos partner with larger zoos and say, you know what, if everything goes under for us, will you take responsibility for our animals? This has to be something that comes from the industry because the sanctuary community cannot either support or uphold this the local government can't either and that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of local governments particularly in the uk are very reluctant to act on struggling zoos because they end up with the responsibility of these animals so the zoo industry needs to really start taking responsibility for its own future look in the direction that it's going they are falling out of favor they're bottlenecking genetically nobody's really buying the idea that they're releasing animals to the wild they need to start making long-term plans for the future. We're still going to have zoos in 50 years' time, but we hope they're going to be consolidated, no longer breeding, and just kind of living out their lives, that we're getting to the point where we have the last generation in captivity. Thank you. I, I feel like we could go on for another two or three or four days, maybe, on this topic. Uh, we have had so many great questions, and I know that we only got to a fraction of them. Um, I would like to thank Amanda from Animal Legal Defense Fund, Chris uh, from Born Free in the UK, Liz, Dr. Tyson from Born Free here in the US, uh, and, and to everybody who attended. Uh, we will be sending out an email uh, later today or early tomorrow. It will include a recording of this conversation. Uh, it will also include links on ways that you can take action and how you can contact us because if we didn't get to your question today, we are very happy to answer that one-on-one -on -one by email. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to, to anyone here on the panel uh, and, and we'll, be, we'll be happy to get to you and, and to talk about this issue more. Uh, it's very clear this is a a very deep subject and something that many of you are interested in. So I hope that we will be, um, you know, talking again soon and, and, and delving in further to this issue. So again, thank you very much to all of our panelists and, and to everybody from literally around the world who joined us today. Have a wonderful afternoon.